Andre over there asking me to go get vodka and wine and stuff like that. And I'm going, Andre, I can't do that. You know, I'm not even old enough. They're like, Yoda, <laughs> Paul Roman, a bunch of boys. Like, how would you, you know, I remember Steve Lombardi. You can't say no to Andre. When you think of referees in pro wrestling, the GOATs immediately come to mind. Earl Hebner, Nick Patrick, Charles Robinson, and of course, Mike Chioda. 31 years as a referee in WWE, and it was such a pleasure to talk to him. And before we dive into this amazing conversation, I want to thank our sponsor for this video, Exter Wallets. Want to say it one more time? Exter Wallets. Exter is the world's largest smart wallet brand, and they've got a bunch of different styles and colors. But this right here is my new wallet. It's made of space grade aluminum, and it's built for quick access. So when you press this right here, boom! All your cards just appear, and they are locked in there. So even if you shake it up, there's no chance that those are coming out. On the back here, there's an expandable metal back plate that allows you to carry even more cards, more money, whatever you want in there but it still keeps that super slim profile. Oh, by the way, it has an integrated RFID blocking layer, so it fends off those pesky data skimmers. But this by far is the best feature. If you're someone who loses your stuff frequently, you won't anymore, because this is a GPS tracker. It's about the size of a credit card, and up top there, that is a built-in solar panel to stay charged. You just connect the card to the app, and you'll never lose your wallet again because you can just ring your wallet. Or, or you can reverse it. If you lose your phone, you can use the GPS tracker, just like that, to ring your phone. So if you never wanna lose your wallet, or your phone, ever again, and if you want a super cool wallet to impress your friends, and if you wanna get rid of that ridiculous, huge wallet that you have right now, this is mine. Look at the size difference here, this is crazy. Go to exter.com slash Chris or click the link down below in the description to get a special discount so you can get your own Exter wallet. Man, what a background you have there. That is, this is incredible. I feel oh, like we're in, a, we're in the Referee Hall of Fame right here. Yeah, it's somewhat, I mean, I got like uh, tons of autograph stuff. Like I just moved in Tampa like a year ago. Okay. So uh, in like, I was gonna, I'm doing, I'm in the process of doing like my one single car garage, like all wrestling memorabilia and start doing some podcast out of the garage there because I wanted sports and all my memorabilia. I got so much stuff. It's like Razor Ramon posters I signed back in the day. And I know I never was a mark for all that stuff, but I figured I better get some stuff signed, you know, after so many years because sure. guys come and go, you know, and I, I gotten quite a bit of stuff I saved over the years. So I have a hell of a collection, but you know, so where were you living before Tampa? Texas for about 13 years. Okay. Well, yeah, you're, I mean, this is smart from a tax standpoint. You're going from yeah. tax-free state to another tax-free state. <laughs> yes. Tax-free state plus as well, like the bigger homes for your money. Oh my gosh. You know, um, and you know, I, I love Florida and I love Texas, you know, um, I love, I'm from New Jersey. So, you know, I miss New Jersey, but um, just, I don't miss the winters and stuff there anymore. And, and the travel <laughs> I, experiences. Going I hear you. So what is this jersey that's behind you? It looks like it's autographed. Yeah, that's autographed from uh, from The Rock and Hulk Hogan. Oh the man! Well, two there. Well, the then let me let me show you a little bit of memorabilia. So let me, by All the right. way, start by saying I'm from Toronto. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. I've... And I was in attendance for my favorite match of all time. Wow. Which is also yeah, Rock wow, Hogan. Look at that. Check that out. Yeah. They, see the um the what a bash that was from the. This is from the, uh, the the front newspaper. The, the Toronto Sun. Sun. Yeah, and that was uh, with me in the corner with Hogan up on the top of Rock. Oh, man. And then uh, the one above it was another, uh, was the examiner, the national examiner. Um, and I got stuff from other, and then down here is like a picture of me over Hogan. I don't know if he could probably oh, see yeah. that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right there. Um, and then... Uh, I got stuff from like South Africa, the front page in 95, 96 with Taker and uh, Taker and Brett. Wow. Um, Aldo Montoya given uh, the splash off. It was, that was the front <laughs> newspaper over there. This is amazing. Um, yeah. And then like the rocks, rock sign that on SmackDown. I got a sign. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I he mean, was I, one of my he was one of my favorites, man. You know. Well, how could you not love The Rock? He's exactly. my favorite as well. So yeah. I, I, I imagine we'd talk about this later in the interview, yeah. but since you brought it up. Rock Hogan is such a special match to me. I was 18 years old. I was wow. there in attendance, awesome. sitting in the 16th row, wow. fully thinking I'd be cheering for The Rock. Right. And then Hulk Hogan came out and all of a sudden we're cheering for Hogan. Brother, that was just, that was the phenomenal thing. I mean, like in, in this one part of the picture, like uh, where I, like I have on my uh, Twitter account, it's like I'm standing there watching Rock and Hogan in the center. And it was like, we didn't do anything. We had the people on the entrance, on the entrance. It's just, yeah. and the way Toronto, like in Canada has been such a, an awesome crowd for wrestling and so much yeah. respect for wrestling. And look at all the great talent that came out of Canada, you know, um, over the years that I've witnessed that is just every guy that came from Canada could work, you know, yeah. and just knew how to tell a story, knew how to sell, knew how to just, you know, yeah. between Jericho to, Edge, Christian, Bret Hart, Owen Hart, all these guys. It was just goes on and on the list, you know? Yeah. But much, much respect for that that night, man. It was just unbelievable. And How you were one of them. <laughs> I mean, you're right. They didn't touch for the first several minutes of that match. How much right. of that was planned? How like how long did you know they you know they were going to be doing that stare down for? No, no, no. That was not planned. They didn't. They didn't know what the reaction was. And then go to the point where you know I talked to Chris Jarrett. I remember Jericho all day. Like he thought that match should have been on last. Well, it should have, yeah. That was on not. third last, which people don't remember. And I mean, Jericho, and we're going back almost 20 years when Jericho was young. He knew, he was like, there's there's no way we should be following this match, you know? And I didn't just, you know, and it didn't have to be like some, it wasn't going to be some high-flying maneuver wrestling match. It wasn't going to be a real wrestling technical match, you know? Um, it was just going to be icon against icon. And they really tore the house down, man. I mean, they... They just had the people from the, the start to the finish. Yeah. I mean, people were so wiped out after that match. It was just like all the energy was taken out after that match, you know? The yeah. Crowd. And, and then it went to the women's that. match. And then and it went to Jericho versus Triple H for the title. That's correct. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Now, Hogan told me a story off camera, and I want to corroborate this with you. Sure. He, he said he had no idea that the NWO was going to turn on him. He said that you got uh, like communication in your earpiece that Hogan had to stay in the ring. And he's like, oh, that's weird. I didn't win the match. But he stayed in the ring, and that's when the NWO came down and beat him up. And he said that it was completely called at, at the moment. Right. Well, I mean, you know, that I remember, I remember them coming down. And I remember them being back there. So that was a question on whether they decided how that match went and where they wanted to go for the next year or so with Hogan, you know, which they did go a different direction after yeah. the end, you know. So that was a call on Vince McMahon's part, I believe, you know. And, you know, like um, they always say, like, don't let the crowd dictate the wrestling business or your match or sure. your ring. You dictate the crowd, yeah. which I, I'm a firm believer of. But that night you had no choice. The crowd dictated the match and dictated probably where that match should have been yeah. in the card. And yeah. then it dictated where they were going to go with Hogan for the next several months or a year. Yeah. I still get goosebumps when I think about yeah, that match. I, I, I can't even imagine being in the, in the ring there. Oh, it was amazing. I mean, I actually really marked out in the beginning of that. I was just, when they were staring at it was in a stare down. And I just marked out just like looking at it, like going, God, this guy Hogan has carried the torch for so many years. Now he's passing it on to The Rock, you know? And then uh, I thought I was going to have several more years with The Rock in the ring, but then he took the torch and went to Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> so. When you rang the bell in that match, you were jacked up. Like you were oh, circling yeah. the ring like you were in the match. I was I was into it, man. I mean, I was probably a couple Red Bulls or something <laughs> at that time. Um, even though it was going to be like a 25, 30-minute match, not a 45 minute match, you know, but um, I was ready, man. I mean, it was just, uh, and I, I like to ring the bell with authority you know. I like to really swing it, you know, and just instead of going dee -dee -dee -dee, or, you know, yeah, like yeah. Give me a bell, you know, I really get into that. And I, you know, that's one thing Vince did like about what I did there to start a match. Cause I was intense. Cause I mean, why not bring that intensity to a title match and to it, you know, I mean, there was points where I was like checking the wrestlers still, you know, at some points, checking the boots, checking the waist, check this, 
just a, you know, a little rundown, you know? I mean, it's like, uh, you know, like UFC gets in the ring, they check their gloves, they check their tape, they check this. And, you know, we got away from that too, you know? But, uh, cause we found out there's not enough time to check the, the wrestlers and all that stuff, you mm-hmm. know? And sometimes I used to like to add a little bit of the old school stuff and, you know, do my own thing with the two and so forth. You know, I mean, I just didn't want to be the same as everybody else. Yeah, you were allowed to have some personality. You were allowed to kind of showcase what made you different from the other refs. That seems to be really lost now. True, true. It is, um, you know, like uh, I was, you know, we were allowed to have our names exploited on TV for a long, long time. Um, we were allowed to do a little bit more things on TV, uh, you know, and, and it's toned down because they just want you and like, and you have to be like kind of biased, of course. You know, you can't, you know, you got to do exactly to the baby face as you're doing to the heel. Yeah. You know, and like they always say, like a lot of referees tend to always get just get on the heels when they're doing something in the corner and this and that. But when the baby yeah. face turns it around, they let the baby face go. It's like, why are you letting the baby face go? He's doing the same thing the heel did. Right. He just turned it around on him, but he wouldn't get out of the corner because he's punching him 10 times. You got to get on the baby face too as well. Yeah. So you got to be biased, you know, like it's kind of, you know, as far as you got to just do your job. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so, it, it, it's so interesting because it used to be referee Mike Kyoto is, and you know, like checking right. on this or whatever. Now it's just the official. Right. Exactly. And you know, like I went to AW in August and October to work down there for a little bit Yeah, with Cody and stuff and Chris Jericho and God, JR, like he did years ago, you know, plugging my name in. And my family was like, oh, my God. My wife was like, I, God, babe, it's the first time I've never heard your name on in years on the TV anymore. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, what are you going to do, babe? I said, I, I appreciate AEW doing that for me. Yeah. They did it in like a few times I was on TNT with them or yeah. pay you. And the WWE hasn't done it in years. You know what I mean? But it was just, a, you know, one thing where I think a referee's name was being said too much on TV one night. And Vince just said, that's just too much information I need to know. And who is this guy? What, what's his name? Who is that name? And they said, it's the referee. And he didn't really recognize the name to the referee in the ring. He goes, ah, oh, God damn it. I don't want to hear nobody's, nobody's say the referee's name no more. <laughs> oh, is that my name too, Vince? <laughs> and it became delete, delete, delete. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, you mentioned AEW. Were you uh, were you surprised that they gave you a call? And who was it that got in touch with you? Cody did. Cody and Chris Jericho got in touch with me and everything. And uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, actually, Cody got in touch with me a couple of weeks ago, so I'm waiting to hear something. So, okay, you know, there's still hope, and I got a good two or three more years left in me. You know? Oh, you got uh, more than that. Come on. Yeah, I do. But you know, I, I don't want to be that. Like you know, Triple H came to me a few years ago and said, "Hey, he's like, you know, a hey, Kyoto, like, you know." moving in a different direction in the company, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, um, I don't want to see you like an Earl Hebner being in a ring for 60, 65 years old. You know, I said, no, I don't want to be that way either. I, I feel like I've accomplished everything I can in this business. Sure. Would I would like to work with this new upcoming talent, Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, and all these, you know, sure. You know, Kevin Owens and all that. And, um, but I said, yeah, my time, whenever my time is. And that's why, my wife got cancer, took a while because we had some good uh, MDA Anderson in hospitals in Houston. Yeah. So it took a while for me to get down to Florida. But then when I got down to Florida, I got released. So I had no idea. I thought I was going to make a transition to go to the PC center in Orlando Yeah. and uh, train the referees, which I was doing when I got hurt. I was hurt from August of 2019, ready for WrestleMania in 2020. But then I got the call at April 15th. So, you know, so I was just dumbfounded. I was yeah. uh, shocked. You know, I was shocked. That's for sure. Well, I mean, when, when you look at everybody who was released on April 15th, I think I speak for everybody when I say that you were the most surprising release. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it was, you know, and I was, you know, it's, I'm not saying, hey, I'm the only guy that got released. And there was many, much, there was people behind the stage and everything. But when you're the only referee yeah. out of all the referees in the WWE, and the most experienced, you're thinking, okay, where did I get my heat when I had bicep surgery, rotator cuff at the same time? Dugas did my surgery in October of 2019. Yeah. I needed about a good six months to heal from both. 
the bicep took longer than the rotator cuff. Um, so, I mean, it was just, I was healing well, going to physical therapy, going down to the PC as well for physical therapy. Cause it's only an hour and a half drive from Orlando to Tampa. Yeah. We're going over some things with the referees down at NXT and I was doing PT with Tara down, down there and boom, get a call April 15th during the pandemic. And I went, gotta be kidding me. Wow. Yeah. Now, it was, the, cool. was the injury like a, a refereeing related injury? Well, yeah, it was. I took a bump. Uh, I remember Elias, he had pulled me out of the ring on one match. Yeah. And it wasn't his fault because you're counting and then he grabs your foot, slides you out of the ring. Sure. That's supposed to be kind of a belly bump, but them bumps can go anyway, either way. So I, I landed on the shoulder, which I tore my labrum Ooh. and then tore something else in there. And then it, I did like two gauntlet matches the next month. And that's where I, that's where like the injury from here, Duke has said from the labrum went into the rotator cuff. And then that's where you tore your bicep at some point. Cause didn't know. And it probably doesn't help that that's the arm that you're using to count. Yeah, for many years. This is right. the money. That's the money right here. Right. <laughs> Not this. It's this. <laughs> the one, two, threes. Yeah, and then the false finishes on two. You know? <laughs> Nobody does the false finish better than you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I always took pride in doing that. Took a lot of pride. Um, you know, when you can get that crowd to stand off their feet and you get thousands of people to rise up, yeah, that means I did my job as well. You know, like if you can, and I used to communicate with the boys too. Okay, keep it close, get it close, and talking as I'm counting, go. You know, and you just come down for that three and swipe it under your, you know, under your chest and everything, and just and you get up and you see that crowd just yeah. rise like it was three. Yeah, it's like it made you feel good as a referee because you're doing your job good. You know. Yeah. If we take this guys back. go like this and they stop, you yeah. know. Some guys, eh. yeah. <laughs> and you just don't get that full effect when you come under, you know, like, so is yeah. there, there's, there's tricks and trades to that, you know? Yeah. If we take this back, Mike, so you grew up in Jersey and yeah. the, the plan was you wanted to be a wrestler. Well, you know, I wanted to, and Gorilla Monsoon changed my mind there. And like, you know, I grew up with Joey Morella um, from Willingboro, New Jersey in South Jersey is about 20 minutes outside of Philadelphia next to Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And um, we grew up in the same township and I worked for Gorilla and he was just giving me words of wisdom. You know, it was just very good advice. And he said, longevity in this business is refereeing. What do you mm. think I'm telling my son? And I'm going to tell you the same thing. And when he found me out there in the ring, when I used to set the ring up and He'd come out, he'd be an agent or at TVs, and I'd be wrestling around with the boys in the ring and snap suplex and this and that. He goes, what are you doing? I said, well, I'll just learn how to bump, Gorilla. You know, he goes, the referees don't bump like that. Hmm. You know, he goes, he goes, I, you know, he goes, you want to be a wrestler or you want to be a referee? And I said, a referee, sir. I said, I'd rather be a referee. He said, I, I'm definitely taking your advice, Gorilla. Longevity is refereeing. Because he's explained it to me. You can have a career like an brought up some of the boys for 10 years and make a good run. But you could be a referee for 20, 30 years, possibly, if you do it sure. right and keep your head on straight. And I did, you know. So, I mean, and God, what great advice in that. 31, 33 years of reffing, 31 years on TV, you know, yeah. and 35 years with the company. Yeah. But, I mean, you were you were a road warrior during that time. You're on the yeah. road like yeah. crazy. I mean, yes. It's, it's such an underappreciated job. A referee, a ring announcer, and a commentator are such underappreciated jobs. That's very true, man. That's very true, you know. Um, and I, I don't know why that is, you know, because, you know, when you watch football, you, you want to see the certain announcers do the Super Bowl or you want to see the certain announcers do baseball. Yeah. Joe Buck's doing this one or that one's doing this. And, you know, it was like Howard Cosell and – Joe, uh, J John Madden doing football back in yeah. the day, you know? So, I, and they were always appreciated really good, you know? But, um, I mean, it, like Michael Cole does a fantastic job. Agreed. Know? He does a fantastic job. So, I mean, you know, in announcing and stuff, but yeah, we are, I, I think sometimes, and especially the referees are a little bit, a lot more under than the announcers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and but you're on the road just as much as everybody else. So I'm, I'm really right. curious you're on the road that much, it probably starts to wear on you. Is there yes. any point during those 31 years with WWE where you went, 
I don't know if I can keep doing this. Um, you know, at some point you get frustrated and you say, God, should I open up my own business? Should I do this? Should I do that? But then, you know, you, you just, um, I get, you get prone to it. Like you were just, you become like a zombie to it. Get in at two or three in the morning, catch your 630 flight, get two hours sleep in a hotel, maybe not even two hours, you know, take your flight home, come home after a 17 or a 20 day road trip. You feel like ass, you know, I mean, you just, <laughs> You were just like, it took you a day or two just to re, just, just to adjust when you got back home, you know? Yeah. And um, my wife always used to say, Jesus Christ, you're so nice on the phone. When you come home after 18 days, you're like miserable. Go back on the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but how it was you, tough. It was tough. But how I mean, do you, you know, make a, a marriage work when you're on the road that often? Well, that's, you know, that's why, like, you know, my wife, she's been very supportive. Meredith and me for the last decade. I've been married to Meredith for 10 years and she's from Texas. And, you know, and I wasn't married. You know, I was married one time for a little while in 2005 from a girl in Germany. But my father got sick at a young age. And my my whole thing is that that's what I didn't want. Get married, have kids, be on the road 20 some days a month, not have that strong enough wife to hold down the fort and out at the home. And then her just maybe say, hey, I'm, I can't deal with this anymore. And yeah. then I'd have kids over here, kids over there. And for many years, I was focused on uh, helping my mother because my father took a stroke in 84. Um, he passed away in 2000, God bless. And, you know, um, and I, I just had to help my mom and pay for her house off, help my sisters get through college, which accomplished all that, which was yeah. phenomenal. And the company for 35 years, you know, I... I have no hard feelings on Vince, you know, that's for sure. Vince, Linda, Shane, and Stephanie, no, no hard feelings with them at all. You know, they did give me 35 years of, of work. Yeah. You know, why they let me go is, was I too old? Was this, I, I don't know, you know, like, so somebody had to get it approved, but uh, you know, it happened. So when it's got to move forward. When your dad has a stroke at such a young age, or right. when you're, you know, when you're relatively young, do, do you, do you start to like take over those roles in the household then? Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, it wasn't my dad was a, a bad person at all or nothing like that, or they were getting a divorce. He got sick and took a massive stroke. Um, so he could, he had to learn everything back. You know, it wasn't just a minor stroke. Yeah. It was a massive, it knocked, you know, his whole, couldn't work no more. So social security mm. checks weren't cutting it. Then I became 18 and, you know, I was working in a machine shop for a couple of years at that point, building test missiles for the Navy, white harpoon missiles. I was a good uh, machinist and welder and everything. But then I wasn't making enough money when my family needed it. My mom had to go out and clean houses. And so she did that from sev several years after that. So I had to step up and I had to be the man of the house. Hmm. So what did I know better when I was like 16, 17, 15, 16 in the summer times and on the weekends working the local from Gorilla Monsoon, he owned his territory from Vince Senior. And this is before Vince Jr. took over everything, Vince McMahon. Yeah. So, um, and we used to work, I used to make 500 bucks a night. I mean, that's, I worked. In the eighties, that's huge. <laughs> it was huge. It was huge. I was paying my mom's mortgage. I was helping her, you know, this, that was after the fact my dad got sick though. So I went back to wrestling and I asked Gorilla, I said, is there any way I can get back into wrestling? So I did. And, you know, and at that point, Terry Garvin was just taking over. So I went on a trial period for a year with Tony Chimmel in a ring truck and I became an employee. And then um, a couple of years later, Chief J made me a referee and I was making great money, you know, doing wrestling again. And it, and it, and it paid the bills for my, my family. For my mother How do you life. make 500 bucks a night? Before working well, for WWF. Okay, so when I worked for Gorilla, we did we did shows in the Spectrum, Wildwood, New Jersey, in the summer times every Monday night on the convention center in the boardwalk. It held like 1,200 people, but I would sell 1,500 programs. And I remember like I'd make 50 bucks setting up the ring, 50 bucks timekeeping, 50 bucks playing music, 50 bucks taking ropes. So it was 200 bucks. <laughs> Arnie Scullin was the agent with the big cigar, playing gin, you know. Andre over there asking me to go get vodka and wine and stuff like that. And I'm going, Andre, I can't do that. You know, I'm not even old enough. They're like, Yoda, Paul Roman, a bunch of boys. Like, 
how would you, you know, I remember Steve Lombardi, you can't say no to Andre. Mm. And I'd be like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like, I'm not even old enough. Well, how would you get alcohol if you're drinking now and it's a teenager? I'd sit at the liquor store and ask somebody to get me a case of Lone Brow or Michelob or whatever. Yeah. And um, he was like, well, that's what you gotta do now. No. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So Andre would hand me a hundred, I would go there. Yeah, and I'd be like, oh my God, if this guy robs me, I'm gonna be pissed. I gotta, you know, I, this guy can't rob me, you know? And I'm like, you gotta get this kind of vodka and you gotta get this kind of French wine, you gotta get this. So I'd get it, come back, he'd tip me 50 bucks. But then when I sold programs, they were a dollar piece. Andre would be on the cover, Rick Martel, Tony Gurria, Big John Stud. People used to buy just like from Andre, you know, like in the board, wouldn't even go to the show and buy a dollar program. So if I sold 2000 programs, I was making only 10 cents off the dollar, which mm. didn't sound like nothing. But when 10 cents off the dollar, you sell 2000 programs, that's 200 bucks there. Right. So I did that at intermission. Then before the show, intermission and a blowout, you know, on after the show. Yeah. And I would sell two to 3,000 programs at these venues, Spectrum, yeah. especially Salisbury, Maryland, here, New York. And uh, that's how I made 500 bucks a night. And I wow. all this cash. And I go, holy crap. Like, you know, because Joey didn't want to sell programs, you know. Dick Worley was the referee. Dick Kroll and them venues. Joey was and so forth. And, you know, I was the young kid. I had to sell the programs, you know. But I was making great money. And when yeah. the first night I did it, made that much money, I was like, I'll do it every night. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got the right attitude. I mean, everything that you're describing is basically, it, it just shows that you have a real great work ethic. Yeah, yeah. You had to hustle. And that's the thing, too. I've been working since I was 13 years old. Wow. And this is like my dad used to own a country club and a golf course and everything. And he made me a dishwasher at 13. So he paid me three thirty-five an hour. I got a check and I worked, even though I, it was le illegal to work at that age, but I was working for my father. Right. So it was, you know, and this is all before he had a stroke and all that. So, and uh, so, I mean, I was working since I was 13. I did that 13, 14. Then I was a prep cook at the restaurant and the country club. Um, then I went and worked. I was 16. I, I worked at the, uh, the famous Burlington Coat Factory when I was, you know, you ever hear of the Burlington Coat Factory? Of course. Well, in Burlington, New Jersey, which was the next town over, that was the original Bur Burlington Coat Factory. No way. So if you ever look in my closets, they're all organized and everything's all neat <laughs> because I was a stock boy and I had to put everything the right way. <laughs> yeah. But I imagine uh, that this work ethic is what led you to be so successful in WWE. I think so as well, too. Yeah. And my father was always work, work, work. The money is not going to come to you. You have to go get the money. Sure. So, and, you know, it's just all about hustling. And, it, and that's, that's what it takes. It does take a strong person to get up every day, not only just to travel for these hours and get to the next city in Europe and here and there, but then to perform your job at night and then yeah. do it all over again for 17, 18 days in a row. Yeah. Beyond just working hard, what do you think really attributed to your longevity and your success in WWE? Um, make sure you're not, you don't miss your flights. Uh, get along with everybody, your coworkers, yeah. I would assume. Um, and just make sure you're, you're getting up every day, not missing your flights, being on time for work. Um, and especially what I took pride in, we've never, Tony and Chimelai, we never missed a ring crew spot. Hmm. Never. Never was able to tell Vince we can't make it to the show. Because, I mean, you, can, you, can, you can't have a show without a wrestling ring. <laughs> you know I mean? I mean, it's just, you know, so that's what we took a lot of pride in because we never missed town. So we did double shots on Saturdays yeah. where we used to, like, have a show at 12, 1 o'clock. And then we had 80 miles to drive. We'd get there at 5, 6 o'clock and then all the... Union guys would be ready or something and, you know, at the building and boom, 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 boom. That ring would be up by 7, 6.45. Boop. There you go. And I mean, it was a ring, bicycle racks and pads, you know? Yeah. But we used to get that up in less than an hour and the show just started at 7.30, 8 o'clock. Boom. And I don't think people realize that Tony Chimmel was the one who was driving the ring truck. Right. Tony and I always drove the trucks and we just, and like one, sometimes we'd have a steel cage truck with us, you know, or <laughs> another ring with us or other equipment, you know, but, um, yeah, we took pride in that. And me and Tony, like 
we used to do 250 miles. And, All right, 250, I'm done. You take over. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I got to give a lot of credit to Tony because he was with the company for 38 years before they released him. You know, and he, and he did. He helped me because I was a young kid. He was about 22. I was 18 when I went full time. And, and he was always, you know, he provided and helped me and taught me the ropes too as well with Joey. Yeah. yeah. So is Tony the person that you traveled with the most, you'd say? Yeah, for 20, 22 years. For, yeah, 35 wow. years with the company. So I'd say about 20 to 22 years we traveled until they took the ring trucks away and then became big corporate, like, you know, 18-wheelers. The, the tractor trailer, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So then who were you still traveling with Tony at that point too? No, he kind of went into, he stopped ring announcing and then he went in more production and then just doing TVs and production and so forth. And then I, I was still doing road stuff. Sure. And, stuff like and at that point, who did you start traveling with? Oh, a bunch of guys, man. I used to travel with Test, uh, oh. Manga, uh, Ray Mysterio all the time. Um, There's a ton of guys I traveled with. Epico, Primo, R-Truth um, over the years. Uh, Jack, formerly known as Jack Swagger, Jake Hager now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and he actually lives 20 minutes from me too. So I get to talk to him a lot, see him a lot. So it's really- well, I mean, come on, everybody lives in Tampa. You're probably yeah. 20 minutes from Chris Jericho as well. That's true. That's right. That's that's true too. In his palatial estate that he lives in. Yes. <laughs> his palatial waterfront estate. Well, you want to talk about hustling and just doing it all is Chris Jericho. Yeah. Love sure. him for that, man. I mean, whether it's Fozzy, rock and roll, um, uh, doing shows on a uh, cruise ship, doing this, doing that. He's just a go-getter. I, yeah. I love his energy, man. Yeah. What advice do you have for someone who wants to break into the industry as a referee? Man, just, um, you know, the advice might change a little bit now because I don't know where with the pandemic and everything, you know. Sure. Well, let's pretend going. the pandemic is over. Let's pretend. Well, you have to have a strong, strong, like you, you got to be on time. You can't miss your flights. You can't party too much. And you got to do your job first, you know, and you have to have um, a strong household at home. Take care of the family if you have a family. Because, you know, you got a woman taking care of the kids 20 days a month alone on the road. Yeah. 20 some days a month, whether yeah. it's birthdays, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Thanksgiving or whatever. I mean, it was just, you know, holidays are definitely um, not a day off in this business. Yeah. That's for sure. So where does it begin, though? If I'm an 18 year old kid and I want to become a referee, what is step number one that I need to take? Step number one, uh, as, as of right now, I would tell a, a young kid to go to the PC Center. Okay. They have, they have an awesome training facility there. And that's where you're going to learn quicker. You know, you could spend 10 years on the indies and not really still not do it the way the WWE wants to do it or sure. AEW or anybody. But uh, right now, I mean, I, I do got to say, you'd have to go down to the PC center. And yeah. that's what I've been telling kids. You got to get to the PC center. And if you can get in there and get trained, right. You know, but has that been a thought in my mind? Like, Hmm. Should I open up a school with some, some of the couple of the guys and think of something like that? You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about it. You're but, in the right, you're in the right place. There's enough wrestling yeah. schools around there that you could That's just say, place. when you're not wrestling training, can I use the ring for, or actually they could, they could be together too. That's correct. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about that path, but then I'm thinking to myself, how many guys want to be a referee? How many people really do want to be a referee? You yeah. know? And it, it stinks because, you know, if referees were getting so much respect or, you know, they were considered this or considered that as talent, you know, like the, I would say, yeah, get that job. Mm -hmm. But I'm kind of like, uh, because, you know, if you're a referee for the WWE, you can't collect royalties. They don't put you on a game. They don't do that. Those things help when you're, you know, royalties and t-shirts and so other things that you can make, you know, while you're working there, that would, that would help you out a lot. You got to remember like uh, the average rest uh, referee probably makes about $125,000. Now I'm that's not great saying money. That's, that's great money. That's great money. That's great money. But if you consider 30,000 a year in expenses, as far as hotel, car, fuel, yep. food, um, so forth. And in taxes, 
you're only coming home with about 60 grand. Yeah. You were in you were in one video game, right? You were in the SmackDown game? <laughs> yeah. And then <laughs> take oh. it right out. Once I talked to Johnny about it, Laurenitis, and it was just a little while after that. And I said, you know, Johnny, I'll split the royalties with, with some of the other reps that have been here for a long time. Yeah. Not just these guys that want to come in for a year or two, have no respect for the business or don't want to really learn or, you know, and whatever. I said, I'll split the guys with, you know, it's her guy, Charles Robinson, this yeah. one. But, um, and then I was taken out and they put, they put some guy in the office, paid him like two grand, $2,000. And he just used him as the referee in a video game <laughs> and the most popular game in the world in professional wrestling. The huh. WWE. Yeah. You know, and they put some, and I'm thinking that's where it really hurt too. I was like, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's so you're saying, you know, you make 125 K, but you can't get any extras. The wrestlers can sell merch. The wrestlers can get the royalties and you're basically flat at that price. That's correct. I mean, and I, I wasn't, I mean, I made that years ago. Sure. But I made, I mean, during the Attitude Era with the ring crew and the referee, and I was making 350 a year. That's amazing. So, and I was getting things paid for because I was doing crew stuff too. So, but when I became subcontracted, when JR turned me into a full time ref, I became a subcontractor totally. And that was roughly about 15 years ago. Now, is that something you had a choice about? Like, could you be like, um, no, 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 I, I just want to continue doing what I'm doing? No, yeah. I mean, like when JR said, look, we want you to be a full-time ref. We want you to be our head referee, that, you know, years ago. Um, and that's the way we want to go with you. This is before we made the transition of Johnny taking over JR's position. And uh, and I said, yeah, JR, I'm going to, you know, after all these years, I'm going to lose my car, this, that. Oh, I'll give it to you. Well, I'll give you that as a gentleman's agreement. You really didn't sign paperwork and contracts then. Hmm. Um, as a referee, you didn't. You didn't sign. Uh, contracts didn't come available until Johnny Laurinaitis came here. Interesting. So did that ever come back to bite you? Um, no, because the contracts are all one-sided for even the talent, <laughs> pretty much, unless you're a special talent. So right, guaranteed money or something like that. So as you can see, <laughs> they just let me go, you know? And I didn't breach the contract. I didn't do anything. Did so, you... Um, when you first got released, and we're coming up on almost a year, it's crazy yeah. that this pandemic's been going on almost a it year. Is. It is. Did you think that eh, this will just be for a few months? They'll call me back and everything will be fine again. Um, they called me a month later. Okay. To do Edge and uh, Randy Orton's match. And Randy had texted me and they really wanted me to do this special match that we're having. Yeah. But at that point, um, the pandemic was going on for a little while. My wife couldn't get in to get tested. She had some complications uh, with her, maybe her cancer coming back. It was the same, the same, di uh, same problems that she had when she got diagnosed with cancer. So the doctors weren't open up the Moffitt here in Tampa. So we had it. I said, you know what? Let's see if we can get into your original doctors, Dr. Haas and everybody in Houston. So she did. She got an appointment. So we drove up there. And as I'm driving, I get a text from Mark Carano. Like, uh, so I get a text and say, hey, you know, there's an extra payday here for you. And I'm like, payday? For what? Like, you're paying me till July 7th to August. Yeah. So uh, what's going on? And Randy's texting me, hey, can you do I said, I'm in Texas. Bro. I'm like, I'm in Louisiana at this time driving. And it was like a Wednesday or Thursday. Her point was on um, Friday. And I said, there's no way. I mean, if she gets bad news on Friday, what am I supposed to do? Fly back Saturday morning and say, See you later, babe. Uh, I got to go do a match real quick. Yeah. You know, like she's going to be, you know, if she gets bad news, which she didn't get bad news. Thank God. You know what I mean? Yeah, thank God. So she didn't get the bad news. And then, so I was at that point, I was like, I can't leave her alone now. I'm like, and then I had to get a physical. I had to take blood work. I had to do this. I'm like, there's no, I don't have enough time to do all that. Yeah. Before we tape this match, you know, they, they gave me like four days, three days notice. And I was in wow. the middle driving to Texas. So, and I didn't want her driving on the way back. Are they going to fly me back to Houston to go get my wife and come back home <laughs> to get the car and drive her back? But I said, you know what? I'm staying with you, hon. You know? So was that the last that you heard from WWE? That's correct. Wow. Yeah. So, but it is what it is, you know? Cause some people ended up getting their job back. You know, I can think yeah. like, 
you know, some people are are back there and I would just, it just doesn't make sense that you're not working there anymore. It doesn't. I know it just, you know, Hey, it is what it is. I, and I, I appreciate it. There's, there's somebody that didn't want me to go out strong and, hmm. and re, you know, retire a referee. I mean, if they would have told me, Hey, this is your last WrestleMania in Tampa, or this is your last WrestleMania here. Yeah. I'd be like, yeah, so I'm ready. I'm so be it. I'm ready to move forward into a different direction. You know, I mean, you know, when I was going down to the PC, you know, X-Pac, Stephen Regal and all these guys, Shawn Michaels and this and, you know, and, and Matt Bloom runs the, the uh, facility down there. And of course, Triple H oversees everything. And yep. I thought I was, man, I, I hope I could fit in here, you know, yeah. and do something, you know. And yeah, it was it was a shocker because I've never bashed my company. You know, my father always told me, don't bite the hand that feeds you. And I never yeah. did that. You know, I just did what I was told when to do it, how to do it, and just went in and did my job every day. That's, that's, that's all I could have done. Yeah. Over the course of your career, how many matches do you think you've wrapped? Oh. Oof. Try to, we, we try to figure, me and John Cohn sat there a couple of years ago. We tried to average some things out. And I always remember there's some nights, many nights years ago, when um, Rune Gale, Jack Lonzo, or Chief Jay Strombo didn't want the commission guys to work. <laughs> so they like, we're not going to let these guys work. I'm like, well, who else is coming tonight, chief? And then chief would look at me and he'd go, you're already here. And I'm going, <laughs> but there's eight matches on the card. <laughs> and he goes, you want a box of tissues with, with this card? <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And then of course, chief bonus me, you know, because those days you were allowed to take cash advances or get paid on the side for anything sure. you did. So he'd just go to Arnie and say, Arnie, pay the kid a couple hundred dollars extra. We're giving 500 tonight. Yeah. Me, 500 plus the ring crew stuff and all this, you know, and the steel cage money. And this was, you know, over a grand a night. That's amazing. You know? So it was to me in my 20s, even like early 20s, I was bringing home some big cash and getting checks. So, so are we talking 10,000 matches? 15, I'd say we came up 15,000 matches at least because I'm, you know, with all the live events that we did and all that, I'm, I'm thinking of anywhere from 12 to 15, at least. Wow. You know, because at TVs and you just didn't do one match at TV, like the main event pay-per-views. Sometimes I did too. pay-per-views. You have one TVs. You would do three or four matches a night on raw or yeah. SmackDown or something like that. So. It wasn't like you only had one match on TV, you know? Yeah. What What did your pre-match ritual look like? You're backstage, you're in Gorilla, you're getting ready to go out. What's your pre-match ritual? Man, uh, say a little prayer. Hopefully my health is good. I don't, you know, my knee holds up. <laughs> Stretch that old body when I got older. You know? um, but uh, just to make sure I had the match straight, I'd go to the baby face. And if I didn't work with him that much before, if this is a newcomer, I'd, I'd ask him, hey, how do you like the referee to work around you? How do you like to work with the referee, you know, or around the referee? If you're a heel, how do you want to get your heat? You want me to, you know, you want to outsmart me? That would be the better, better way. Just don't do shit in front of me because it's going to make me look stupid. Yeah. And then really, it's just going to, you're not going to get the heat. The heat's going to be on me, you yeah. know, I mean, certain things, you know, and I, and not, not saying I was going into business for myself by any means it was just if you want the heat you better put on you as the heel not yeah. the referee yeah what would you say in the course of your career was the biggest mistake that you made in the ring oof uh in the ring wearing white underwear over black pants when i split my pants <laughs> <laughs> uh no let's see I'm, I'm sure i made more mistakes than that uh, I can't think of any like Mike, famous Mike Kyoto botches. Yeah, I know. That's what, you know, I, I, I know I botched a few matches up there somewhere along the line, you know? Um, yeah, I was, I, I got to say count three when I wasn't supposed to, you know, and I did that a couple times, a few times, never on TV, I think. Well, th yeah. Never. I'll knock on wood for you too. If it's not on TV, I, I don't know, know if it really matters then. Right. Well, it does. It does on, you know, some guys take it real serious some talent but when working for vince mcmahon for that long what would you say is the biggest piece of advice that you learned from him maybe he told you or maybe you just kind of like observed it from him but what do you think is the biggest takeaway from vince um you gotta stand your ground at some points 
you know? Sometimes, I mean, whether he's right or wrong, you're going to agree with him. But then at some point, you got to stand your ground. Um, I think the more that you stand your ground a little bit more, he respects you. Mm. But, you know, being a referee, and I, I know he loves hard work, and he knows certain people in that company, like myself or Tony Chimmel, that give you give 35 years. You know, I just didn't take vacations when I wanted to. I didn't, you know, um, I was out for six months with this latest injury. I was only out for three months, four years ago for an ACL. I had a cadaver put in by Dugas and um, kept my career going there. And I mean, I was only out for maybe nine months of injuries that I had at 35 years yeah. and suspended once. <laughs> so, Wait, I don't know months. if I know this, suspended. You no, know. <laughs> everybody knew. But um, yeah, I got suspended. It was uh it was for that fake marijuana that was oh, running yeah. around in the gas stations. <laughs> I mean, a couple of guys were we were trying out, we got drug tests, and they're like, and I didn't smoke it for three months. Huh. And I said, How the hell is this stuff in my system to do research in Redwood, California, where this stuff came and all this other they were doing research that these metabolites stay in your body for like a year? Wow. So it wasn't like you could smoke marijuana in 30 days, it's out of your system, or two yeah, weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or do some other drug that's out of your system in three days. And, yeah. You know, so I found out this and I said, no wonder I failed it because I'm telling these guys, I haven't smoked that stuff and I didn't want it in three months. They didn't like it. Yeah. So um, I just went back to old school. So, I, <laughs> but they suspended me. I think they made an example out of me at that time. Mm. So they wanted, because somebody that there for so long, we can do this to Mike Kyoto, we'll do it to you. Yeah. If you were on the road for that long, and now you haven't been on the road really at all. How's that adjustment been going from hundred miles an hour for 30 plus years to just slowing right down to zero? Man, um, it's tough. It is tough, especially with the, the pandemic and everything. And like, even if there wasn't a pandemic and I lost my job, I'd be like, Hey babe, let's go to Italy. Let's go here. Yeah. Let's go to Spain. Let's, let's go to Germany or let's go here. Cause I love to travel. Yeah. I love to travel. And you know, I've, taking my wife to about 12 different countries and her favorite country is Japan. She can't wait to go back to Japan. So, uh, and that's one of my favorite countries as well as Japan. So, I mean, um, it's been, a, it's definitely been a change, but it's, it's actually like, wow, like I'm living this kind of normal life a little bit, you know, it's like, but it's a little boring. It is definitely boring. <laughs> it is boring. How <laughs> much of a wrestling fan is your wife? Uh, She's a fan of me and she is a fan of some of the other guys, my friends like our truth and Jay Kager and, you know, some other guys that we've hung out, Ray Mysterio and so forth. And she's very good friends with Ray and Angie, his wife. And, you know, so she likes to watch the guys that we, she knows very well, Yeah, but she's not much of a wrestling fan. Now yeah. her son is, her son, Kyle is, he's huge, huge wrestling fan. It's not like you're not doing anything at all. Like you've been, I think everyone will know that you're doing uh, the Monday Mailbag on adfreeshows.com. Yes, yes. Which is like, it's so cool getting your insight on everything that's going on in the business from your perspective. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. And it's, and it's great that Ad Free Shows and Conrad Thompson, and now I'm working with Paul, Paul Bromwell, and he's doing a fantastic job coaching me. I mean, Paulie B and... Paul Brown, I can't thank him enough. And Conrad Thompson to give me the opportunity to tell my story out there, yeah. you know, as a third man in the ring. So, um, and that's, and I really appreciate them giving me the opportunity and it's going very well. And so, I mean, yeah, please everybody check it out. You know, it's, and we're doing this watch along once a month. I'm doing it with Paul Bromwell as well. So we'll go over a match. We'll pick a match from a pay-per-view or from yeah. somewhere and we'll watch along with the top tiers and stuff of ad free shows. So and it's going very well and I'm enjoying it. And there's a lot of stories. I mean, I'm definitely going to think about writing a book soon. So I just want the book to be good. I don't want it to be too long, but I got a lot of stories. So it's it, it'll be coming out sometime soon. Well, you should talk to your friend, Chris Jericho. He knows a thing or two about writing books. That's true. And I will. I will buzz Chris. I will. Hey, give me that good writer because I'm going to need one. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. I want to go over some of my favorite matches that you've been a part of. We, of course, talked about my favorite match of all time, Rock Hogan, gotcha. yeah. legendary match. But there's a couple other matches and moments I want to go over here. Uh, Big Show and Brock Lesnar with the ring collapse. 
Oh, that was that was that was cool. Um, Michael Hayes, everybody, Pat Patterson. The thing on that match they wanted me to do it was to sell the collapse of the ring, like, and they the way I did it, which I don't know what I did. I just did what I had to do because it was actually pretty freaking cool. I'd never been in the ring with a collapse before. Sure. So it was just like they was like because. When they take the bump to, to shoot all, out of the corner, the ring collapses. They're selling. They're out like a light. I'm the one sitting up like, holy shit. Like, just what the hell happened, you know? And I remember them just screaming like, yes, yes, that's what we want. Yes. That's what you're hearing in your ear? Yeah. And I mean, it was just, and then the crowd's just, holy shit. Oh, you know, and. And it was just like, it was just one of the moments. Like it wasn't, the, the pop wasn't as big as Rock and Hogan, but yeah. <laughs> it was there. How it did, there. like logistically, how did they get the ring to collapse on that impact? Well, it's, it's uh, they do a very good job. Mark Carpenter, which I had worked for many years with going back, he's, he builds the rings for the WWE, which was WWF at the time. Um, so they did some kind of hydraulic thing to where, and it was like, they put bags underneath the ring to where it's it's like airbags. And mm -hmm. it was just a hydraulic thing where they released the pressure and it just collapsed the ring. So it just, it pulled out the poles. And so they didn't use the cables. There's crisscross cables that go underneath the ring on the bottom poles. Yeah. But they used something else to where that ring collapses. You know, they used hydraulics and stuff. It was some kind of hydraulic in it. I mean, it collapsed perfectly Perfect. on time too. Perfect, yeah. Definitely. And this yeah. isn't something I imagine that you could have rehearsed before either. No, they did. I think they, we didn't rehearse it in the ring, but they did rehearse the ring collapse. They did re rehearse it before. Like that so. was that was the iconic ring collapse. The ring has right. collapsed, you know, a handful of times since and people kind of go, eh, it's not the same as when it happened on you know, SmackDown. First time ever done, right? I mean, yeah. So you gotta admit, like, wow, like the things that they used to come up with were fantastic sometimes. I mean, you know, um, and it was just uh, I mean, we didn't even finish the match. We didn't, you know, it was just like the ring collapsed and just and that was a moment of history in professional wrestling. Yeah. So yeah, I was and it was great to be a part of that moment. And if like, and I remember Michael Hayes saying, You gotta sell this, like you just it's never happened to you before. I said, yeah, all right, cool. But when it did happen, it was like, what the fuck? Like, what the hell? Holy shit. Like, I think it just came natural because I just really couldn't practice that, you know? Well, your reaction was perfect. It's exactly yeah. what, you know, should have happened, I feel yeah. like. Yeah, I didn't. And there's, I guess there's times you can oversell or undersell, but I guess, I guess it was right down the middle to where they <laughs> sell it, so... You know, and I, I guess the focus was on me at that point. And that's what was going to be the focus was on the referee, just sitting in the ring, looking around, going, what the F just happened, you know? So, yeah, it was a pretty cool moment, you know? Let's go to WrestleMania 19, Kurt Angle versus Brock Lesnar. And Brock goes to hit the shooting star press. Ooh. Kurt Angle's almost three quarters of the way across the ring and Brock Ooh. lands on his head. He did, but I'll tell you, Brock almost hit that. He almost hit it. I mean, it was, he was far out. And, I and knew Kurt it. told me that was supposed to be the finish of the match. Yes, yes. And then we went a different direction. And uh, yeah, I mean, God, when a neck injury like that happens, you know, it's sad, but... um. Yeah, I remember being in that dome and that was a big WrestleMania moment. It was just, and then I was just like, and Brock is like such a big dude, but he's athletic and he can, he could do what he needed. You know, I knew he could probably get there. It was just, just a little bit too far out. You know, when, when Kurt Angle was laying there and you're looking at that, you're going, I know. Can he actually hit that? I, well, I was looking at it going like looking at the distance and I'm thinking maybe, Kurt's going to feed in a little more or maybe make his way in a little more or something or, and then he just went and I was just like, ah, oh, I didn't, when it happened, I just cringed, I cringed, you know, it was just like, ah, yeah. So, um, you know, thank God he was a, a big enough dude and built because I think anybody a little scrawnier, a lot scrawnier than him would have broke something. Completely. Yeah. When he made that initial impact right on his head, yeah. what did you think? 
oof, I was hoping to not another draws moment, you know? Mm. So uh, I've seen a couple of them and a couple, you know, it's just, it's, it's not a pretty sight. Definitely. It's, it's just not, um, you just, I just made sure he was okay at that time. And he was kind of, he was, he was, he was off. You could tell his eyes were glassy and it was like watery and glassy. And it was just, it was not right. But I remember we getting Brock to the back and they rushed him right away to the hospital. Mm. So, were you you'll have to forgive me were you in the ring for draws and d'lo brown uh, i i drove i i came in and flew right into the match that that day I, right after it happened so they sent the referees and and so forth i believe that was in long island i want to say that was in nassau coliseum mm. um and i remember them saying get down to the ring you know it was the same thing with owen um jimmy corderas was in the ring at the time he's from yeah. toronto as well and and I came down the ring and it was just not a pretty sight, you know? Yeah. So, Randy Orton versus Cactus Jack in the street fight. Man. Oh. <laughs> was that what, that was when Randy took all those thumbtacks, right? Yeah. And, you're, and you were <laughs> counting in thumbtacks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I remember Randy going, Jesus Christ. Like he was just like, like, I don't, he didn't like those matches too much, you know? And because uh, he wasn't that type of wrestler, really, you know, that match made him, though. It did. It really did. You know, and um, Randy, I remember he was going, ah, like he had about 50 thumbtacks on his back and all that other stuff. And I'm going, oh, my God. I remember saying, oh, just think about the payday. Just think about the payday. <laughs> 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 I mean, what else are you going to tell him? You know, I mean, trying to keep his momentum up, you know, a little bit. But um, yeah, I mean, Cactus Jack, Mankind, this guy, phenomenal, unbelievable. And then uh, I love working with Randy too as well. And yeah, that match was, that was, that was, uh, that was a little bit out of control, but they got through it, you know, for Randy's sake, that was just a normal day for Cactus Jack, you know, sure. in the ring. But for Randy, I think he was more worried about, am I going to come out of here with 10 scars, gashes, this, that, you know, but he came out of it. That's I remember sure. seeing, there were a lot of thumbtacks in that match. And I remember before you counted going, how are they going to count this? Right. I remember wiping off the mat, then counting. And I you still counting. got thumbtacks in your hand. And I still had some thumbtacks in my hand. I went, ah, I'm like thinking, if this hurts, I got to I gotta imagine how Randy feels with 50 thumbtacks. Because, you know, Cactus Jack, Mick Foley does this every week, all day long. Yeah. So he's used to it, you know. And uh, yeah, but I mean, you get through that. I mean, and the things as a referee, you can't complain and bitch with five thumbtacks in your hand when you're seeing the boys going through what they're going through yeah. to make the match what they, you know, what they want to show to fans, you know? What was the first big match that you got assigned to? Oof. Um, I remember like back in the day, it was, I think it was uh, Mr. Perfect, the IC title. That was one of the first big matches. Um, I want to say with Kerry Von Erich or something, or but I think it was a TV match. The first biggest match that really stands out, what I did is a uh, six-man tag in um, 92 Wembley Stadium. Mm. Um, you know, I, I kind of made my de debut on 89, 90, like 89 in TV. But the first biggest, because like, you know, you had to pay dues to get those WrestleMania spots. You had to pay some dues. You had to, whatever, you had to be experienced and you had to be good at what you did, better at what you did. And I remember 92 was like, really blew my mind away because it was like 82,000 people. Joey had the match with um, Bulldog and Brett. You know, that was a phenomenal match, 45 minutes long. And it was 82,000 people in Wembley Stadium. And that was my biggest crowd and the night of a show. Taker was there. Everybody was there. So I would, I'd probably say that was probably the biggest television, first television match I performed in front of crowd sure. otherwise. All right. I got one more here for you. Sure, it's bro. uh stone cold Steve Austin versus Shawn Michaels with Mike Tyson as a special guest enforcer. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, I mean, like there at that point, I wasn't scheduled to do that match. I didn't know oh. important match on the card, but then they had called me and told me, Hey, Earl got sick. Um, he had some type of aneurysm and stuff. And uh, 
they said, we need you to step up and do this match. I went, sure, no problem. Awesome. You know, and, um, and that was, that was awesome. I mean, it was great working with, of course, Stone Cold Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels, one of the greats, these two icons. Yeah. Then you have an icon in boxing, Mike Tyson. Yeah. I remember going up to Mike Tyson. Hey, Mike Tyson, how you doing? I'm Mike Kyoto. How are you, sir? He goes, brother, I know who you are. I watch you all the time. And I'm like, you watch me? <laughs> He's like, man, you're, you're the coolest referee, man. I love you, man. I'm like, oh, shoot. I'm like, Mike Tyson knows me. <laughs> and I was, but that was great, man. And, um, you know, everything went well. I mean, I taught him how to count, but he counts so fast. <laughs> yeah. Just, I was kind of telling him, just got to count one, two, three. And he went, boop, 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 boop. I went, he oh, got excited. Boop. He got, yeah, excited. he did. He did. <laughs> the screw job was in. <laughs> <laughs> so you were getting to a point in your career where guys were requesting you for their matches. That's correct. Yes. yes. That's amazing. No, it's, it, it was a great feeling. Which I mean, was the one know, that meant the most to you? Um, Rock and Hogan, I'd have to say. Mm. I mean, but you know what? I don't want to take, I, I know I keep saying that, but there's so many other matches with Triple H and, and so many other ones I've done that are great matches with Stone Cold and this one and and Shawn Michaels and over the years. I mean, I, I really just, it's hard for me to really place these matches in order, you know? Yeah. But, and I'm not taking away from anything, you know, just by always saying Rock and Hogan. But, um, I mean, you got to figure that was one of the most icon against icon matches in, in re the professional wrestling business. Absolutely. And, and that's why I do put that first. But there were so many other matches, too. I appreciate that. And it comes from, you know, Vince in these production meetings, Michael Hayes, Pat Patterson back in the day. You know, these guys would be like, okay, Mike Kier is going to be the referee of this match. Obviously, they all agreed on it, you know. If the talent didn't want me there, they'd say, no, we don't want him. We want somebody else. Hmm. So, you know, the talent could say that too. So when the talent, and definitely when the talent says it, okay, the office has to go with it because if they feel comfortable working with me as far as experience or knowing I'm going to be there for the spots or for the bump, it's a great feeling. It's an yeah. awesome feeling, man. It's a phenomenal feeling. Now that you've spent time in AEW and obviously, you know, most of your career in WWE, yeah. how is the refereeing style different between the two companies? A little more different. Uh, WWE really, really tries to make this like a real sport, you know, and it, and it, is, it is real to me. I mean, there's nobody else than these professional wrestlers going out there doing the stuff that they do. Yeah. It's phenomenal. Cutting promos to taking bumps to high flying to doing what they do best. There's nobody in the world that does it better than some of these, you know, really, I'd want to say a few hundred guys, you know, yeah. 300, four, you know, two, three. In the whole world. <laughs> whole world. In the whole yeah. world. Between AEW, WWE, New Japan, or whatever, um, all these, you know, Ring of Honor and everything. There's a lot of great talent, but, you know, these guys, they, they just, they really like, and sometimes like when a new guy comes in, like Seth Rollins, it's like, holy shit. Once I think I seen it all there, here comes Seth Rollins, you know? Well, oh, there's another moment we didn't even talk about. Yeah. <laughs> that RKO. Jeez. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. And Randy Orton. I mean, it's just his RKO. He, he did that AJ Styles, the way he is, the way he hits that forearm. And he's so athletic in the ring and so forth for a guy, his size He's a phenomenal yeah. worker. You know, and I didn't work with him for all these years. And I see him come in. I'm going, holy shit, where'd this guy come from? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Heard of him. Watched him on a few nights at late night over in Japan. And said, damn, that guy's got talent, you know. And then at least I got to work with AJ, too, as well. Sure. Mike, I've really enjoyed this. This has yeah. been, oh, man, this has been so insightful. It's just been great hearing all these stories. Yeah, I appreciate it, Chris, for having me, man. Hopefully we can do this another time. Oh, man, I'd love so to. And people can stuff. listen to Monday Mailbag. Is it every Monday on ad-free shows? It's every other Monday. Yep. Every other, every other Monday at shows. Ad shows. Yes, dot com. Yep, with Paul Bromwell. And uh, yeah, tune in, check it out. We got a lot of great stories, a lot of true stories. <laughs> so there's nothing really to hold back now. I mean, what am I going to do? Hold back for what? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is why we got to look forward to your book. Like, have you thought of a title for what your book's going to be called? 
Man, I was thinking about third man in the ring, but it's actually happened already. I think it's, it's from a boxing standpoint, we checked it out. Ah. But I am going to get third man in the ring. I'm in the process of patenting that right now. So It should be called, what do you say? Yeah, right? What do you say? That's all I used to say. What do you say, Rock? What do I you love say? it. Yeah. What do you say? <laughs> hey, you want to give it up? <laughs> I, I, I thought we should have started this interview. What do you say, Mike? What do you say? Yeah, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it's just, you know, Ad Freeze has been a big help, you know, and keep me live out there and stuff. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. You know, Paul Bromwell and Conrad Thompson. So I really appreciate that. And they're going to be able to help you push this book out too. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be great. You know, yeah. this is all new to me, like social media <laughs> stuff and everything. Cause I wasn't a big guy on social media at all, you know, and still not, you know, but so it's, it's, it's a new way of living though. I mean, working from home. Yeah. So, you know, and hopefully when things open back up, I can you know start going, doing some things around the country and around the world. Yeah. So. Well, you, you see it behind me here. I say, be great, be grateful. And I believe that if you can be grateful in your life, you will live a great life. So yes. I end every interview, Mike, by asking, what are three things that you're grateful for in your life right now? Uh, right now, I would, man, it's easy because it would, it would be my mother and she's still living and God bless her heart. She was a strong woman and she took care of her family. And, um, you know, my father, my family, my two beautiful sisters, five beautiful nieces, my wife, Meredith, family, my health. And, and I appreciated the 35 years of working for WWE. Yeah. Um, I was grateful for that. I am, I'm still grateful. You know, I have nothing to be remorsed about or to be pissed about really a little bit of things, a little upset about, you know, the way things ended, you know, sure. but what do you do? You can't sit back and cry. So I am thankful for my health. You know, I still have it. And because without your health, like my father said, you can have all the money in the world, son. But if you don't have your health, how do you enjoy it? You yeah. Know? So uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for a lot of things. Be honest with you, more than three things. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been an amazing career and it's not over yet. No, it's not. I mean, you know, I do got a few good more years left to me. I, like I said, I don't want to do this. Till I'm 54. So I don't want to do this till I'm 65 years old or anything. Yeah. I can go to I'm 57 or 58, whatever, and see where it takes me, you know? Yeah. So, but I'd like the uh, the end of the career the right way, you know? Hopefully I can retire AWF or... Yeah, and hopefully it's in front of a crowd. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. And one more we can hear those Mike Kyoto chants. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I'm on my mic, I know. It's like my Sharona, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Man, this has been fantastic. Mike, I, I can't thank you enough. Man, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate having me. And you do a hell of a job. And I was checking out a lot of your uh, interviews, man. You do a great job. You're awesome. Oh, it's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank and, you. you know, it's, it's my pleasure to be able to share this last hour with you. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. And you enjoyed. Stay safe out there, okay? You as well. Thank if, you. Uh, where are you at now? In LA? I'm in LA now. Yeah. Okay. If I'm ever out that way, I'll hit you up. Maybe we'll Please. hit up some lunch or something or dinner. First round's on me. Nah, it's all good. Second, third, fourth are on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take you up on that. You got it, man. Hey, you're plugging me. So I got to take care of you. <laughs> Appreciate it, man.